My name's Netta. I'm a graduating senior, and I'm majoring in business and psychology with a minor in global poverty and practice. Um, my name is Julia. I'm an exchange student from Germany, where I get a master's in management and economic science. My name is Richard. I'm a third year business administration major. Hi, everybody. I'm Ryan. I am a third year business administration major as well. Okay, so as you can see, we're a pretty diverse group. Um, we come from different backgrounds, and we reflect the class, which is also uh, a mixed group of people from different majors and different ages, different backgrounds. Um, what we're planning to do today with you for an hour and 15 minutes is we're going to give you a little demo and a little um, simulation of our class um, <laughs> until about uh, 2.15 and we'll kind of take you in our activities and show you what we did in the class. And then for the last 30 minutes we have a video for you um, of the class and we'll also have a panel where you can ask us questions about our experiences and last but not least we'll give you a short pitch on how you can get involved and what's the future of this class. So um, and with that I'm gonna ask you to find a partner because you actually have to work a little bit in this workshop so try to make eye contact with somebody you feel drawn to um, and yeah you'll see what that's about and now I'm gonna hand it up to Richard. <laughs> Thank you, Julia. So I'm actually going to put the screen up here because we're going to be writing things on the board. Um, so if you see the paper in front of you, it says experiential learning activity. So we're going back to class um, and we're going to go ahead and uh, do something real quick with your partner. Assume that we're giving you $10,000 to donate to one or more nonprofit 501c3 organizations, however you see fit. Think about the following, what's on the paper for three minutes and jot down some notes. Your values, what, you, Im what impact you expect your donation will make, your personal ties to the organizations. Then, once you think about that, we'll go on to the next step. <laughs> Three minutes, go ahead. Got about 30 seconds left. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, looks like most people have finished. So um, now what we're gonna do is choose an interest area 
and discuss the questions that are on your paper with the person sitting next to you, your partner. What interest area would you focus on and why? And who would you discuss your decision with and why? And just as an example of interest areas, the two that we chose were education and alleviating poverty. That should give you an idea of what your interest areas could be. So go right ahead, discuss with your partner. Okay, so I think we're just about out of time. Don't want to cut you off, but uh, we're going to go ahead and do the group discussion now. Hey guys. <laughs> so uh, we're going to do the group discussion now, and uh, we're actually going to go around and if every every partner uh, or every couple uh, could actually just go ahead and let us know what you think was, uh, you know, choose a question, give us your answer, talk about it a little bit. Um, we're looking for Twitter-sized answers because of time, uh, so please go right ahead. Anybody would like to start? Huh? So what are we doing? Oh, the two questions that were on the paper, though. What interest area would you focus on and why? And who would you discuss your decision with and why? So feel free to, would you like to begin? <laughs> sure, our, our area was education uh, because we think it's the, uh, the key for the next generation, one, and secondly, the key to the success of the country long term, uh, and particularly in California, given the dysfunction in our whole education system, including its sources of funding, uh, it's something we we would like to uh, focus our efforts. I'd like to address. Great, thanks. Oh. How about you guys? Yeah. Well, well, go ahead. Personally, personally, I'm actually very interested in, in the arts and so forth, when it, but when it comes down to giving money, I'm actually kind of interested in turn to international development instead and thought about the need there to impact their <laughs> that was kind of a shift. So. Very cool, very cool. Thank you. Okay. Well, we, we had different things, but I think uh, the two we had, I, we, I had education as one, and the other area is really opportunities for improving the community, and that's mostly sort of in the social service mm -hmm. area, and then my partner had um, <coughs> environment. And also elder care, because then I have that's right. experience. Okay. Got it. Got it. Um, so for us, we didn't align on one thing. We also had two, two different sides. Um, so for me, it was also education. Um, just given how core it is to my own personal value of the importance of developing people um, and engaged citizens in our midst. 
Um, and then Michael um, was his focus was on sustainability, um, kind of generally about sustainable usage of our resources. Just because, again, absent any action from us, things don't look so good down the road. So that's okay. there. Sure. Um, social justice, but with uh, uh, gender. Sort of gender equity is probably better. Than yeah. And probably more focus on um, developing countries rather than just bigger issues. Yeah. And, and, and my, my interest area was really kind of helping um, social entrepreneurs to have more impact. And a lot of that's around development, but it's environment and a range of issues that can relate to that. Very cool. The other area I had was uh, foster care and transition age youth. Transition out of foster care. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> was that? Uh, <laughs> no, there's, there's connections in the room. Um, he's, he cares about foster care as well. Um, I picked a charity I was familiar with and then walked walked it back. So um, there's a charity in Oregon called Forward Stride that teaches um, autistic and Asperger's kids to ride horses. So it's a special needs emphasis, teaches socialization, problem solving, self-confidence. And our choices are, at least my family's choices, are based on personal, you know, very personal family needs. Personal and family needs. Yeah, of course, of course. So uh, now, uh, if you guys don't mind, anybody in this room, who would you ask for advice? When, sorry, who would you ask for advice when you're making these decisions? If even it's a larger amount than 10,000, who would you go to? Who would you seek out? Just curious. The Anybody decision have? to actually write the check or the decision to the, pick that organization? The decision to pick the organization mm -hmm. to essentially, who would you go to? My, my spouse. Spouse? Anybody else? Does it have to be a who? No, it could be uh, an organization as well. So you could go, for instance, get GuideStar and look at the organization. Perfect. Nice. There we go. Okay, GuideStar. Mm -hmm. A professional fundraiser, and so I have lots of fundraiser colleagues, so I'd probably check with them too. Check with the colleagues, okay. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Anybody else? Different, maybe brother, sister, family, other family, other than spouse? Kids. Kids, okay. Cool. Very cool. So, uh, what we've just talked about, um, we actually spent a lot of time talking about our interest areas, and we'll discuss that later. Um, also, uh, talking about who we would go to for advice. GuideStar uh, was actually one of our sources. There were many sources that we went over. Um, and so now I'm actually going to turn this over and uh, go ahead and move to the next section with uh, Netta. So there you go. Yeah, put it down. OK, so just to get a feel for you know, who we have in the room. I'm wondering, how many of you have heard of the expression theory of change? All right, so for those of you who did raise their hand, did you, would you like to maybe give a stab at defining it? Anyone? I promise we don't bite. <laughs> Just a brief definition or overview of what theory of change is. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Um, Do you want to? Oh, gosh. <laughs> if I get it wrong, Nora will be mad at me. <laughs> there are no wrong answers here. Um, I think just, just kind of generally the way I think about it is, you know, seeing a need and basically how your organization is going to, by doing something, can bridge that need and be able to um, affect change in, in that particular way. Awesome. Great. Did anyone else want to add to that or et cetera? Okay. Well, very briefly, the way I conceptualize a theory of change is looking at it as a blueprint for how you're going to accomplish your long-term goals. Um, and Nora actually gave a really uh, good overview of what theory of change kind of, how to conceptualize it in my mind is um, strategy is to business, as theory of change is to nonprofits. Um, and then I have a definition, which is very wordy, very verbose. So it's a conceptual linkage among an identified issue or problem, a desired change, potential strategies, and values that guide <coughs> the work of an organization. Um, so 
I think the best way to really conceptualize a theory of change is to go through an example of a theory of change. And um, I wanted to work through a theory of change for our class in particular. Um, and I use our class as an example because that's kind of the common thread among this. Um, but you can definitely apply this to any goal that you're working towards. Um, so the first thing that you really want to do in crafting your theory of change is to identify a problem or a need. And when undergraduate students came together to design the curriculum for our course, Strategic Philanthropy, there was clearly a need or a problem that they had identified. And that need in particular was there is an absence of information regarding how to strategically give. So there's a lack of education around strategic philanthropy. So that was the need that they identified in particular. And from there, they asked themselves, well, what's our intended impact? Who's our target beneficiary? And they said, well, we really want to target emerging professionals. So now there was an identified problem, an identified need, and from there they worked towards creating a target beneficiary or demographic. And from there you ask yourself, what, what activities or programs are we going to engage in in order to, one, you know, really prove or capitalize upon that need, and then two, to hit our target beneficiary. And then they said, well, let's develop curriculum and a class that really educates people about the field of strategic philanthropy. And we're gonna create a course that's not only lecture style, but is experiential, so that the students can really interface with the material at hand, so that they can research organizations, so that they can develop presentations on these organizations, and then give grants to these organizations. And from there they said, well, what's the output? What's the short-term goal of what we're doing by engaging in this activity of having a class? And so what they said was, we want educated students to come out of this who know about strategic philanthropy, and we're also going to give away $10,000 worth of grants. And then the last question you really ask yourself in, in crafting a theory of change is, what is your long-term impact or your long-term goal? And that's really, it comes down to a ripple effect. A ripple effect in that when you educate students, you do so with the intent that they are in turn going to educate other people. And that's certainly come to fruition in that we are all standing here as alum of the class, also telling you about strategic philanthropy with the hope that this will have a ripple effect and you all will tell others about strategic philanthropy and giving. And also there's a ripple effect in the money or the grants that you give. Because you do the legwork, you do the research, to give money to really great organizations with the hope that this money will have ripple effects and influences for years to come in the community that that particular organization is working in. So I crafted a theory of change statement given all of these sectors, and I'm gonna read it aloud. So our theory of change is to educate young emerging professionals about strategic philanthropy through an experiential learning course in an effort to effectively give a $10,000 grant to a local-based nonprofit and in an effort to develop a community of strategic philanthropists, both of which will have enduring impact. So I went a little crazy with the colors, as you can see, but there's a reason for it, and that's because each of the colors represents one of the five domains that I just spoke on. So educate, that was the need. We needed more, we needed more educated people in the field of strategic philanthropy. Who are you educating? What's your intended impact? The young emerging professionals. And then what are the activities or programs that you're going to engage in in order to educate young emerging professionals? Well, it's in green. You're doing it through an experiential learning course. And then your output is that you want to effectively give a $10,000 grant and you want to develop a community of strategic philanthropists. And lastly, what's your long-term goal or impact? You want to have enduring impact. You want to have that ripple effect. You want to have that multiplier effect and scalability that will hopefully perpetuate into the future. So the theory of change is really a crucial way of working towards developing your goals. And it adds discipline to your giving. Um, and it's a really great framework in that it allows you to give in a way that is ideologically balanced with how you approach something. So in developing a need, in developing you know, a way by which you're going to target that need, you bring your emotions into strategic philanthropy. Because inherent in philanthropy 
is listening to your emotions. So by delving into a need, by delving into activities, you're doing so with your own ideology in mind and your own perspective in mind. So that's a little bit on theory of change, and I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to Ryan. Hi, everybody. Hope you guys are doing well today. Um, so we're going to back out of theory of change. Um, you guys kind of have interest areas that you spoke about. What we want to go into now is kind of once you have all of that established, how are you going to have criteria, guiding principles that you would then evaluate organizations based off of? Um, so to begin, you guys all said a broad area of interest areas. Um, it's across the spectrum here. So with that being said, I kind of want to take a minute or two for you guys to just shout out, again, Twitter size uh, responses if you can. Just things that you would consider important criteria when evaluating a nonprofit. Um, that can be also if you feel like it's more comfortable or for profit, but preferably nonprofit if you can. So. Ability to deliver. Ability to deliver. Okay. Yeah. Uh, sustainability. Ability to scale. Okay. Yeah, that. Sustainability, ability to scale. And dem demonstrable outcomes. Outcomes. Yeah. Strong governance. Strong governance. Legitimacy. Legitimacy. Are they real or are they, you know, some shady operation that's not even. We actually had uh, a Doris Buffett say that exact same thing to us. So, um, <laughs> Focus. Focus. Impact. Low administrative costs relative to total revenue. Admin cost. Anybody else? Their ability to meet their strategic purposes. Ability to meet strategic purpose. Okay, we have a lot there. Um, what we're going to do is kind of transition from that. Uh, so our class was able to think of our own criteria. A lot of these are very similar, um, and that's a good thing. It means we're both thinking alike. So I'm going to pass out a uh, list of kind of the, the top criteria, um, the headers that we came up with as a class for you guys just to look at. Um, take a minute or two just to look this over, kind of compare it to the list that we just created, um, and then we're gonna bring this back to a discussion in a second, so. So if you guys also want to, you can write down what you guys came up with if you think that's important. What I kind of want to hit on now is comparing the list that, that we gave out and what you guys thought of, what stands out to you guys? What um, are things that you wish you would add now looking at that, looking at your list? Um, kind of what are things that maybe you would even take off? Because this is your criteria that you'd be using to evaluate these nonprofit organizations. Yeah. Well, the one thing I really like that I don't see on this list is strong governance. I don't think you want confidence that um, if money is contributed, it's going to be used as expected. Uh, one thing on your list is strong dynamic leadership that we seem to be on. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one thing that occurs to me, and I'm not sure it's on either or how you'd say it, but um, that I would think about is, do they need the money? 
And not only do they need the money for the mission, but there are some organizations that have come under criticism because they have so much money they can't spend it, or not to name names, but they're, we feel education is really important, but there are some higher education organizations that just seem to have such a ton of money. Do they really need a more? Would not be Berkeley. <laughs> <laughs> not be Berkeley. Not enough. But yeah, we all know. Like I said, not going to name. But you know, they, they have so much money that you think, well, if I gave my so if I gave my money to Harvard, for example, would that be would, would I be able to have the same kind of impact as if I gave it to, you know, maybe another educational organization that didn't have the same um, resources? So I, I don't know what to call that. Resources? I don't know. Need. 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 But, but everybody will say they need money. That's good. So that's why it's, you know, somehow you have to qualify that. Yeah. How's it going? Yeah. I was wondering if there's, you could tease out three versus five. In other words, capacity to execute, maybe that's just, it's like a snapshot and potential for impact and growth is sort of here in the future, but there seems to be kind of overlap between them. Because, yeah. you know, your capacity to execute directly related to your potential for impact it would seem like. So I'm trying to figure out what you what was meant by the two to sort of a question. Okay, I'm, I'll, we can actually answer things like that, I think, more in the panel. Um, okay. But what I'll, what I'll tell you now, which is kind of interesting, is we cut off all of the bullets underneath these. So if there was anything that was kind of uh, ambiguous, we had quite a list here. Um, but we're trying to make it so that you guys kind of feel comfortable thinking of your own criteria because ultimately this criteria can be used to evaluate any organization um, and what it allows you to do is remain strategic so um, what happened in our class a lot with the discussion was you make decisions not necessarily based off of the best reasons and ultimately having a criteria make sure that you can remain constant and consistent with your philanthropy so that's one of those reasons why you would make, remain strategic Yes. I think to give you to give you an example, because right now these bullets seem to be kind of overlapping, and um, potential for impact and growth would be: is it like can we multiply this effect? Can we replicate it in another city or in another area? Whereas capacity to execute is within the organization how it is right now. It's more like scalability. Yes, that was like one of the bullets. Thank you. Yeah. I have one more criterion. Um, I would look at the other donors to that organization and what sort of a community they have and do I want to belong to that community of donors. Because every nonprofit has that group and events and you know, opportunities to manage. <coughs> One of the things I would look at, uh, can I make a personal contribution to the organization beyond mm -hmm. just funding? So beyond the dollar kind of investment. Mm -hmm. Okay, any last ones? All right, that's, that's a good list. So this is for you to have, um, and we want you guys to just consider this. Also on the back, um, throughout the day at any point, we kind of outline the theory of change um, line so you can kind of create your own theory of change. Preferably not right now, but more so during a, uh, another discussion. So um, with, with that said, I'm going to be passing it on. Grace, sorry. <laughs> Hi, I'm Grace. Um, so a lot of the activities and processes that you were just walked through um, are the exact activities and processes that we walked through together as a class um, in order to make a crucial decision, which was um, how do we best spend $10,000 in terms of giving it to nonprofits that can fulfill these criteria um, and also make um, a social mm -hmm. impact beyond the dollar. And um, so we, as a class, we received $10,000 from the Sunshine Lady Foundation, which is um, Doris Buffett's foundation. And um, so we met for three hours every Thursday um, with Nora and two other instructors who kind of walked us through um, the field of philanthropy, um, going over nonprofits, foundations, and grant making, um, and ultimately making a decision as a class. Um, it was very experiential and very hands-on and a unique experience. 
So with that, we're going to show you a video from last year's um, strategic philanthropy class to kind of give you a better idea of what the class was like. economics at philanthropy, I like it a lot because it really makes you think about how well you could actually use your dollar to help nonprofit organizations. Philanthropy today is different from just writing a check, which is what I originally thought it would be, so this is why I took the class. It's more about engaging with these organizations, becoming a part of them, becoming passionate about a cause, and wanting to really be a part of the change that you see with your money. Uh, philanthropy is not about indiscriminate giving, rather uh, that it's about a strategic approach you uh, give in. We actually have $10,000 given to us by the Sunshine Lady Foundation to choose two nonprofit organizations and, and donate them to and make an impact with that money. And so what we did in our class was we divided into two teams, one education team and one environment team. And then we each decided to uh, pick the nonprofits that we thought could really make a difference and fit well with what we overall wanted to do with the money, which is make a very strong impact in the Bay Area community. It's been very challenging because there's so much that goes on behind the scenes that people don't even think of and we've been doing site visits, phone calls and interviews and it's just really a learning process about how each organization can use our money effectively. We're now uh, presenting to the class and going to vote as a class on which uh, which specific nonprofit for each of those main industries is going to get the, uh, the funding? On behalf of the students of the 2010 Economics of Philanthropy class, <laughs> thanks to the Sunshine Lady Foundation, I'm excited to announce a $10,000 grant to the following two amazing organizations Spark and Swords to Plowshares. Congratulations. <laughs> Um, so, with that, we are now going to open up some time for a Q&A student panel discussion. Um, since this was a student experiential class, we really want you to be able to engage with us and hear about um, our journey as strategic philanthropists throughout this course. Um, and then, so I'll be asking them some questions, and then we'll open up some time for you to be able to ask them some questions. <coughs> So the first question is for Netta. Um, Netta, why did you choose this class? What was your perspective of philanthropy upon entering the class, and how has that changed throughout the semester? OK, great question. So um, as I said before, I'm a fourth year graduating senior. And so I really wanted the classes that I took this last semester to be relevant to what I do in the future. Um, and so I've really been looking into international development frameworks. And there's a lot of theory. There are a lot of great organizations that you could potentially go into. Um, and I was really looking for a quote unquote strategic approach for what I wanted to do with my future in terms of international development, just because they're is really like a plethora of things that you could potentially go into. Um, so what really attracted me to this class in particular um, was that strategic that came before philanthropy. So strategic really applying to any element of your life and then thinking on how philanthropy can be strategic was an intriguing concept to me because I didn't know that there was a way to strategically give. Um, I just always thought of philanthropy in isolation from strategy and that's certainly not true. Um, and then you said, how has my perception of philanthropy changed? Um, when I thought of philanthropy, again, um, 
I really thought of it in isolation in terms of it can be applicable to individuals. It can also be applicable to an entire field. So foundations as being philanthropic entities. Um, and I was really thinking of philanthropy in terms of corporate giving. Um, and so this really broadened my perspective and my horizon on what philanthropy is and how extensive it is. Great answer. Um, thanks. So the next question is for Richard. Um, how did you come to this decision? Um, walk us a bit through the process of selection of um, the nonprofits and narrowing down from the initial issue areas. And tell us a little bit about what organizations we decided on as a class. Sure, you got it. So um, we started out with 16 different issue areas. That's right, all of us came into the class pretty much with different issue areas. We had uh, 20, 25 people in the class, 16 issues. So uh, we narrowed that down from 16, got down to two. Uh, and our two were education and alleviating poverty. Um, that last year was education and environment, but we were education and alleviating poverty. So once we had our two issue areas, we set up th six different groups throughout the class, three for education, three for alleviating poverty, and each of our groups went out and did our own research, found a whole bunch of different organizations from all over the Bay Area, and uh, then, of course, we had to narrow those down. We got down to two for each group, down to one for each group. And that last organization that we had, that we all felt was the best for each group, we went ahead and researched, got every piece of information you could possibly think of from sources like GuideStar, sources like Foundation Center, uh, Google searches, their websites, et cetera. Once we had the info, we made our presentations and uh, we gave them to the class to convince the class that we would make the most impact by donating to our organization. From the six groups, we narrowed down to two in each issue area with our first democratic vote. And then we had our second vote to go from two to one in each issue area. And uh, we ended up choosing one from each. For education, it was first graduate, uh, which is based in San Francisco. And they actually provide services to first in their family uh, students to be able to graduate college. They follow them for a 10 year track uh, all the way from when they're in seventh grade through when they graduate. Uh, and then our second, of course, was in uh, alleviating poverty and that was Operation Access. And Operation Access provides surgeries and other medical services to uh, those who cannot afford them, uh, those who cannot uh, afford to go into the normal hospital system and uh, do them in there, I believe, all over the Bay Area as well. Uh, most of them are in Sonoma, though, if I could be wrong. Could be wrong, but yeah. So uh, <laughs> I, that's, that's pretty much what happened. Narrowed down from 16 issue areas to one, or to two, and uh, then came down to an organization in each. Thanks, yeah. Richard. So as you can tell, it was a very complicated and process and really long. And so there obviously from this process, there's a lot of personal kind of struggles and challenges that we went through. So Julia, um, what were your biggest struggles and personal challenges in this class? Yeah, so this class seems to be a lot of fun, and it is, but it's also super hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's really challenging for two reasons, at least for me. The first one is I chose the suitcase clinic with my group and just being there, being on their site and seeing the suitcase clinic is helping homeless youth in Berkeley and I'm walking down Telegraph every day and I'm seeing there on the street and I really believe that the suitcase clinic is doing a fantastic job, they're volunteer run and we just got so emotional about helping the suitcase clinic that all of a sudden it wasn't really about getting a good grade out of this, it was more about we need to win, they need the money, let's do it, let's just give everything everything we can. So um, holding this presentation, I was a lot more nervous than I would usually be. And I learned from this challenge that giving out money is a lot of fun, but it also means to say no to people who are doing fantastic work. And um, that's kind of my lesson learned for um, this potential field of work. And the other challenge was um, there was so much pressure, not only the suitcase clinic, like not only the organizations we represented made us to be really emotional about winning. There was also, we had three teachers instead of just one. We have alumni from the other class earlier, so we're like kind of a part of a bigger group than just students. We're working in a team, so you don't want to disappoint your team. And then there was Doris Buffett in the room. I mean, who, who wants to fail in front of Doris Buffett? Um, <laughs> so it's really not only a class, it's a lot harder. Um, which also makes it challenging and a very large learning experience. <laughs> Thanks, Julia. 
Um, so last question is kind of about um, where, as students, we learn from this class, where are we going in the future, and how has this class really affected us? So Ryan, how has this class impacted your future philanthropic decision making, and what do you think is most important for people to know about strategic philanthropy? Okay, um, so I think the, the big takeaway that I learned from this class, and most of my classmates learned as well, is kind of there's way more than just giving away money. Um, being in Berkeley, all of you guys are Berkeley alums, uh, you walk down Telegraph, I was a part of the suitcase clinic team as well, and you see outside of a lot of the diners, people asking for money, and just kind of that right there has impacted me, because I see people give away money, and then I see organizations where they can make such a difference with the money you give them, as long as you just put in a little bit of time and a little bit of research and kind of see what's happening. Um, I think the other main thing that I took away is growing up like most people, uh, I was volunteering um, with athletics a lot. And I don't know if that was the best thing for the organization that I was doing. That was just something I could provide, but I wasn't really strategically thinking about what they needed and how I could best help them out. So going forward, those are my things that I'm keeping in my mind. Thanks. So now we're going to open up a time for you to ask us questions, too. Um, so does anyone have any questions for us? <laughs> huge group of um, organizations to maybe give to, did you decide we're only going to do local? Like, What was your range of um, organizations? Were you looking at international organizations or were they just local organizations? And did you set the criteria beforehand? Uh, so we were given a we were given money by the Sunshine Lady Foundation, and there weren't very many restrictions, but one restriction was that we would need to give to a Bay Area-based nonprofit. So um, it, in that respect, it was locally based giving. And was there a site, like I'm not familiar either with these, the Foundation Center or GuideStar. Um, how did you guys get that initial list of who you could even consider? Like, was there one place you could go and say, we want to do education. Give us a list of 100 groups in the Bay Area that we should look at. Sure. Um, so the first half of the class, we didn't think about any organizations at all. We just had amazing panelists, guest speakers. So we got all these resources on hand. We had actually one of our guest speakers is in the room, <laughs> Jay. And um, also, we had somebody from Foundation Center coming. Um, we had people mentioning GuideStar, so kind of hearing these people talking, those names were coming in the room over and over again. And then there's just a lot of research. And yeah, we asked, most of our panelists, we asked for advice. We're like, where do you look and what do you do? I guess a similar question. Do you have any tips or tricks on how to kind of wade through this whole body of research that's out there to you know, determine these questions that you're asking? Um, without um, giving something away that's coming in a few minutes, <laughs> if you turn around your sheet, we have a resource list for you <laughs> that you can use later where we list resources. Dave? <laughs> yeah. I was wondering if any of the organizations uh, were very good at measuring their own impact and being able to give it to you in a compelling way. And I'd uh, love to kind of hear if there were some, some examples of what stood out for you and how they were able to do that. I'll, I'll start it and we'll see what else happens. Um, so one of, the, one of the things that we looked at is like a metric for success. Um, and with the suitcase clinic, they did surveys um, of their audience as well as the services that they provided. And we kind of saw of all the clients that come in, what services are they requesting? Are they, do they continue to provide those services? And are there needs that are not being met? And are they trying to make those a part of the, the suitcase clinic event that they put on every, every once a week? So that was specific to my organization. A lot of other organizations um, will base that kind of, they'll have some sort of metric of success that they, they evaluate. And you can kind of gauge that. I don't know if anybody else wants to. Uh, so for me, a personal metric of success was seeing what clientele had been served, and then if that clientele was later on the board, 
or was having a very significant role within the organization later on down the line, that was a really good trigger for me that the organization's doing great work and being very impactful. Um, so that for me is a measure of like scalability and a multiplier effect and having ripple effects within the organization itself. Because if you're able to later contribute to the organization that helped you firsthand, I think that's a really good sign. So that was a personal metric of success for me. And I think Richard wanted to add to that. Yeah. Could you describe the dynamic within the class as it tried to focus on particular program areas and then within the individual teams as they tried to focus on individual organizations? Richard's laughing, so I'll give it to him. <laughs> so that was probably the hardest part of the class. Um, truthfully, <laughs> as I said, yeah, we, uh, we started out with like 16 issue areas and um, Everyone was very, very attached uh, at the start to their own thoughts um, and slowly but surely through a lot of hand raising and a lot of, well, this is why I feel that way or this is why this issue area feels, it seems really important. We were able to really narrow that down a lot. Um, and then of course we did have a democratic vote to get to the, the end result. Um, it, it really was a push uh, to be able to get us to narrow those down. And truthfully, it was all individuals or groups of individuals you know, kind of banding together to say, well, maybe this really is the issue area that we should go after. Maybe this is the organization that we should go after. Um, we did do, actually, once we had our separate groups, we presented our possible organizations to other groups um, in one of the class periods. And we made sure that uh, essentially <laughs> we weren't, let's say, presenting an organization over like one over another that could be better. Uh, we, we didn't recognize was better. Um, but so we, we got external, I guess, uh, external help for which organization of the last two that we chose for each group. Uh, and then we narrowed that down to one based on that feedback and based on the way that we felt. So. I want to add on to that. <laughs> Sometimes I felt it was so painful. You're sitting in a room with, for three hours, and you're, the, first, the first class period you call, you talk to, think about your own values and what you really care about, but in the end you're supposed to like compromise with 25 other people. So <laughs> but it's also a lesson learned, because um, in the end it's not about like winning or kind of battling the other people, it's about making the best decision as a group. So, and I can also tell you like kind of an anecdote that our democratic decision making was always super close. It was always 11 people on this side and then 12 people on the other side. <laughs> All right. We have like three people there, three people there, three people here, three people here, and then there's five who are undecided. So um, I think the concept of the class sounds really easy. Just give out $10,000 and I can, I'm sure all all of you from the top of their head can name a really good organization that can need that money. So it was really all about this process to sit together and be patient with um, everybody who's in the room. But there was incredible people in the room. Like We all like learned a lot from each other um, and that kind of reassured us. <laughs> yeah, Flora? Um, so it sounds like you had a bit of a hybrid experience in terms of kind of individual versus foundation um, philanthropy. And so just focusing on the foundation piece a little bit, did you spend any time analyzing um, how various <laughs> foundations give out money? And also, would you say, if you've done that, um, do you feel like foundations, without naming any specific one, give strategic yeah, so actually that was our whole first half of the class, was looking at um, foundations and different types of foundations and their um, focus areas too. Um, so we learned definitely learned a lot about foundations um, in the Bay Area, and we had guest speakers come in. Um, and I think the consensus in, or the general feeling that we got was that they do make strategic decisions, and they also warned us a lot that um, grant making is not easy because they have so many of these considerations and but I think we saw that through their own process and also through um, their their discussion of which focus areas and how they arrived at those focus areas um, showed us that they, I think a majority of them do give strategically at least the ones that came to us and spoke. In the course description, do you, you know before you go in, you're going to have half the classes to be battling with each other for consensus? I mean, do you really think you're just going in there to give away $10,000? 
Are you, before you went to the class, did you know you were in for this? <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, so I um, I heard about the class from one of my fraternity brothers the year before who said he really enjoyed it, but I had no idea uh, that we were going to split up. And actually, um, I think it was asked earlier, I was resistant to give up my area of interest the entire time. Um, so I ended up in the poverty. The, poverty alleviation um, and we chose homelessness and I was looking up arts and sports activities that the homeless could be with because my initial area of interest was after school kind of programs for students so uh, that's how I stayed with that but no I had no idea that it was going to be divided and actually I'll, I'll say that it was even going to be worse when um, when there was going to be one grant and we decided to do two grants which made it m much easier um, in kind of not throwing everybody against themselves so Yeah. Given what you just said about how difficult it was to choose, was there any discussion about um, would the ten thousand dollars have been more impactful with one organization than having five thousand dollars at two organizations? Or you just didn't you want to? There was definitely a discussion over that, um, and it ranged. It wasn't just two five thousand dollar grants. It wasn't one five thousand dollar grant. It was should we give a grant to everyone? What then? Um, and th there was a huge discussion that um, we faced in terms of impact. And ultimately, I mean, it was the two big decisions: were one ten thousand dollar grant or two five thousand dollar grants. And again, I think the class was split. 11 to 12, so pretty evenly in terms of what we wanted to do and how we wanted to distribute that amount. Um, and we ultimately came to the decision that we would have two $5,000 grants, um, or two grants. Um, and that was based on, because there are two issue areas, we really want to reward these two very diverse issue areas. And then, yes, so we mentioned that we also had a $2,000 donation, an additional $2,000 donation. Um, by a donor who came in and spoke, uh, and so there were two six thousand, or there were two five thousand dollar grants plus an additional um, additional amounts for the other remaining groups who didn't get that grant money. So we were very lucky in that respect. Um, any of you that are graduating soon, um, are you going to work in the nonprofit or the public sector? That's the first question. And the second is, with these organizations that you gave funds to, did either or any of you evolve into that's a perfect question so I'm leaving the country in three weeks I'm already like packing up stuff to give to the suitcase clinic because I'm definitely not going to be able to take home all my clothing and books so yes <laughs> um, and the second one is I can only picture myself in either philanthropy or nonprofit, and I think this class has especially helped me to be on both sides. Because now that I understand how donors are money are like giving out money, I feel like I can be a way more effective fundraiser than I was before. So it's not only it's really teaching you both sides. Because I know what questions I'm going to be asked. I've talked to um, like 20 donors or so. Um, and I know how my class has made their decisions and what arguments you'd need to bring up to convince them, even though our team didn't win. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, well, for me personally, I'm interning at an organization in Germany that's doing exactly that, um, researching nonprofits and evaluating them. A little more on the quantitative side, but that's like, and that's only because of this class. Yeah, I guess we can all answer this one, uh, unless, uh, well, Regarding the uh, the um, large gift, is this money going to be spent by this organization over a relatively short period of time? And what's going to happen to the program after the money is spent? Without, so, without I, additional support. I, truthfully, one of the things that we really looked at and that we honed in on was whether the organizations were sustainable. And I think that came up in the, the discussion. Um, and truthfully, the organizations that we gave to, uh, both of them had budgets of over a million a year. 
um, over a million dollars for their operating budget. And for that reason, they have long-term re uh, repeating donors. Uh, they also have a, a very good workforce that is going out and getting additional donors, additional single single donors, uh, single-time donors as well. So. Our specific donation of $5,000 to each organization will likely be used, as you said, um, in a relatively short time frame. However, um, over time, hopefully that will make a lasting impact. Um, as an example, one of the ways, or one of the things that we had thought about for first graduate, um, I was on that team, and we had thought that they could use it toward materials. Um, actually, interestingly enough, that uh, donation, that grant, got doubled by a, a challenge grant that was given to the organization. So with that 10,000, um, hopefully they'll be able to actually provide materials for one year for all of their classes, um, and then actually use those materials for coming years. So it's a little bit of um, a little bit of leverage there in terms of buying one thing and then using it for multiple periods. So, the, so the gift was restricted. Uh, we we did not restrict it. Option? We did not respect it. No, no, it was unrestricted. However, we we gave kind of our our thoughts um, as to where it should go. But I'm sure that they they may direct it in a different direction if they feel it's more necessary in a different different area. I just want to add something real quick. So one of the things that my group decided early on was that we cared a lot about the impact that the dollars would have. And the suitcase clinic had a $3,000 budget for a year. So their annual budget was $3,000. We were going to be giving them $5,000. Well, the youth clinic, which is what we, we cared about. Um, so in terms of you guys and your giving and strategic thinking, uh, that was something that we cared about a lot. So we were going to be able to provide a mental health counselor for a year. Um, that would come every week. We were going to provide new curtains for all their um, their practices. We we're going to buy, I think, two computers. We we're going to allow them to have meat for their their food because currently it was all vegetarian. Um, so that was to us a really really big thing factor, I guess, in our in our decision making process. It obviously takes a lot of time, a lot of effort to do strategic philanthropy, and some folks either don't have the time or effort to do that. Some folks may be affiliated with Harvard and they're always going to give their money to Harvard or a religious organization or whatever it is. Is there a sense of what percentage of donors out there actually are willing to do something like this, or what percentage of donors actually engage in, in the hard work that it takes to do what you're doing? Yes, there was a recent study by Hope Consulting it was commissioned by a few foundations and of uh, major donors. And I believe it was about 30%, under 30% of donors who thought about it strategically by self-report. And was there any discussion about whether or not that's changing? Because I, I have to say that my sense is this, your generation is doing things differently and maybe have, and there are so many more resources now on the internet than there was, that were available to people. 15 or 20 years ago, um, and that people did give more based on affiliations, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. But is that, that's just a feeling. Is there any validation of that? Not yet. This okay. was the first study that I know that was done asking just that question. It was just done last year. So in a few years, we can see. Has, um, I mean, Doris, Doris Puppet, is yeah. she giving this money in perpetuity to keep the class going? 10000 a year? Yeah. Three years. Three years, OK. This is the second year? Yeah. Um, we're hoping for maybe additional donors so we can't open up this class for fall, too, because currently it's only offered in the spring. Um, okay. Any more questions? Because with that, we'll move on to Julia. Yeah. Okay. You just made the perfect uh, transition, because <laughs> I'm going to talk exactly about that. Um, I'm going to talk about the future of the class and how you can in get involved. Um, First, how you can get involved. So we really want to make an impact also on you. That's why um, we give you the resource sheet that I just mentioned. So if you turn around your handout that was lying on your seat before you, when you walked in, there's a list of um, resources that we recommend you. Oh, yeah. OK, um, we have plenty of copies. So uh, each of you can take three and give it to your friends if you want to. Um, yeah, so we just, I mean, I, we don't want to give in, go into that. We don't have time for this right now. Um, but you can just go on the internet, log online, and be empowered, think strategically um, about how you maybe want to manage your giving. And then the other thing that we care about is um, 
this is not only a class, this is an institution. Like it's not only go in there, get a grade, be happy, graduate, forget about it. This is really an institution. And because this is an institution, um, or it is an institution because it has a win-win-win effect. We all win, and that's the good thing about it. Like we as students get an incredible experiential learning experience. We're empowered to give $10,000, which is kind of nice. Um, the nonprofits we choose get both. They get screened really hard and s we scrutinize them, but they also get kind of a label because we tell them that six Cal students um, investigated and we all think they're worth the money and that's kind of a brand. So that's something that they get and they also get the money. And <laughs> the other thing is that um, the money that Doris Buffett spent, she spends it double. She spends it on education to educate us, but she also spends it, what she really spends it on is the organizations that we give to. So really everybody wins in this situation and because we think the class is so great, um, we, th we thought about how we could make it even greater and how everybody should have the opportunity to take the class. So, um, and what Grace just said, we are hoping to find more donors. And if we have more donors, um, first thing we probably do is offer it in the fall, because right now it's only offered in the spring. And we have the capacity to teach it, we just need another $10,000. But why stop here? Why not also offer it on an MBA level? Because those people are also going to have money at some point and want to give it away. <laughs> I mean, some of you are MBA alums. Um, so if we have another donor, or if we have more money, we could offer an MBA class. And then, why stop there? Why stop in Berkeley? We have eight University of California campuses. Why not offer it in Davis? Why not offer it in Santa Barbara? Why not compete against each other who finds the best nonprofit? And then, we don't even have to stop there. We can export it to other states, we can export it to the East Coast, and we can even export it internationally. Like, I'm happy to bring it back to Germany. So, um, we really hope that this class spreads in quantity, but we're also trying to get into quality. Um, we're thinking of a couple of things. For example, we are having a Facebook page where we engage our alumni. So, once you graduate from this class, you'll always stay in the loop, and um, we'll, you'll come back, report how your experiences were, and maybe you'll become one of the panelist guest speakers. We have this logo, I mean, who, which class has a cool logo? Um, <laughs> so we're having a logo already, and um, that's something we really wanna expand on. We wanna have a brand, so nonprofits in the Bay Area can go out there and say, we won the Cal Strategic Real Money Real Impact Award, and be excited about this. It just needs a little bit of time. Um, so, we have this plan, we have this marketing plan, and we also have a website, which is um, currently created. We'll have a Twitter account, we do have a Facebook, you can like us on Facebook. Um, and we would really get you involved too, because right now you're an alum of this workshop. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, <laughs> this is the end. So, what you can do to help us, I know we have one person in the room who's already been our panelist guest speaker, if you feel you have experiences that you can share, some of you have these cool donor stickers, um, <laughs> come, come to our class and report. And if not, and you just want to be kept in the loop or ask us more questions, um, we have an email sheet that we'll pass out. So I ask you to leave your email and I promise we will not sell it to anybody. We'll only um, shoot you one email and um, tell you about our website and about how else you can get involved. So thanks for coming. This is the end, and yeah, thanks to everybody.